Thank you very, thank you very much, Michael, for your uh, very kind introduction. I want to thank uh, Lori and the World Affairs Councils of America for inviting me here to speak to you today. Uh, Lori is a very old friend, and when Lori called, uh, I immediately decided this was a great thing to do, uh, and I'm uh, happy to be here. I'm also very pleased that I will be uh, followed by a superb panel, my old friend Paula Dobryansky, who is over there, Fred Burston, who was my first boss in Washington and my first mentor, and has been throughout my career, Jim Zaroli, who is a very old friend, Jim Bremer, as well. So you've really got a great panel that will be following up my uh, presentation. I also want to thank the World Affairs Council for presenting us with a very challenging topic of uh, is there a need for new global governance? Uh, this is a challenging topic. It should take uh, all afternoon and then some to do the justice. Uh, so let me try just to make a few points to start the process off and uh, then I will describe some of the ways in which we as an administration, as a government, are proceeding. Basically, I think, uh, just to start the, this off with the central point, at least as I see it, is that we are seeing the emergence of new types of global economic cooperation, if not actual changes in global governance itself. And the U.S. has been leading and needs to continue to lead on these efforts. Uh, we as a country need to strengthen America's capacity to shape the world's economic future in ways that serve both our national interest and global interests. But it's worth noting at the outset that proactive policies abroad are only one part of this overall effort. Of at least as much important as what we do at home. Putting our economy and our budget on a sound financial footing dramatically strengthening our educational system in the United States, systematically modernizing American infrastructure, and reducing our energy importance through clean energy development are all critical elements to our ability to get our own economy on a stronger track going forward. They're also critical to our international economic leadership. The very best of our efforts internationally will be jeopardized if we fail at these efforts here at home, if we cannot deal with our educational challenges, if we cannot deal with energy, if we cannot deal with our financial situation, and if we cannot deal with our infrastructure problems. So pulling our act together at home, particularly in this very competitive global environment, is critical not only to our future well-being internally, but to our future uh, leadership as well. I also think it's useful to reflect for a moment on the changes that have taken place in the global economy in a relatively short period of time. Uh, Václav Havel, the former president of the Czech Republic, made a statement that I think is very interesting and reflecting on what's happening. He said, things have changed so dramatically over the last two decades that we really haven't had time to be astonished yet. Um, and when you think about it, it's quite interesting because these changes are astonishing. And just from my perspective, I first came to work in Washington in 1969. Then uh, U.S. trade was about 10% of U.S. GDP. Today it's roughly 25%. At that point, foreign investment in this country was about 1% um, of our GDP. Now it's something on the equivalent of 10%. And of course, at that point, the emerging economies were not really playing much of a role in the world economy at all. In fact, China was barely a factor in the global economy. India was a minor factor. Uh, Brazil was a somewhat greater factor, but not an enormous one. And Russia was not part of any global institution at all. Uh, the growing importance of emerging markets today uh, is really one of the dramatic changes and poses an enormous competitive challenge to the United States. But I think we also have to look at it from another perspective. It also it, uh, suggests uh, and creates enormous opportunities for our country. And I think we need to focus on those at least as much as we do on the kinds of challenges that we face, which we see in the paper discussed every day. Our ability to adopt in this country to help our companies, 
to help our workers and to help our nation compete in a more integrated and competitive global economy is critical. And if we succeed in doing that, we will also succeed in improving living standards and high quality employment opportunities for our people. And those will grow in coming years as the global economy expands. Our continued success will partially depend upon new patterns of cooperation that we establish in coming years. The U.S. is, as I mentioned, increasingly dependent on trade, the stability of the global financial system, capital flows from around the world, a level playing field for American companies seeking to trade in the global economy, and for American foreign investment, the openness and stability of global air, sea, and communications interconnections, and many other factors. We must continue to work with global partners to ensure that the evolving economic system serves our interests as well as those of our major economic partners. The President will shortly embark on a long and important trip to India and Indonesia, and the trip will end up with visits to Seoul for the G20 summit and to Yokohama, Japan for the APEC summit. So global economic cooperation is especially high on our agenda at this very moment. I will touch on, the, on these summits later on, but I want to make a few general points at the outset about U.S. international economic policy. The key point is that we can best support our country's economic interests in this new global landscape through active engagement, through opening new markets around the world, through encouraging foreign investment into productive <coughs> industries and areas in the United States, to developing new ways to advance cooperation with the emerging economies, seeing increasingly these countries as potential partners in achieving their objectives in the global economy. Let me step back for a moment before we go to the current issues that we face and look at where we've come over the last 50 or 60 years. This is not the first time when America has been faced with major challenges and major shifts in the global economy. After World War II, the United States made difficult but correct choices to lead at the dawn of a new and very uncertain era. Three generations ago, Presidents Roosevelt and Truman, along with Secretaries of State Marshall and Dean Acheson, sought to construct an international economic policy to meet the challenges of their era. At the time, there were many Americans, and we tend to forget this today, but there were many Americans who wanted to turn away from global responsibility and turn inward, addressing our own domestic problems and forgetting about or minimizing our activities in the rest of the world. Even the historic Marshall Plan originally had many detractors, and President Truman himself didn't even want to introduce it because he thought that if he introduced it, introduced, introduced it, given the fact that he was so controversial, he wouldn't pass in the Congress. So he liked General Marshall, or Secretary Marshall, to it, who had a greater degree of popularity. But the fact was that it was not immediately popular, and it was not immediately understood by Americans that the United States had to play a global leadership role after World War II. What did the United States do? And I think it's useful to look back at the formulas and the approaches we took at that point and how they may relate to our circumstances today. The United States, first of all, rose to the challenges of change in the global economy by doing what was necessary at home to strengthen our economy. We invested in infrastructure, the Eisenhower Highway Program. We built new post-World War II industries throughout our country. And we invested strongly in education, particularly after the challenge of Sputnik. These set the predicate, the basis, for strong American growth at home, but also enabled us to have the resources and the international strength to do what we had to do internationally to enhance our position and to deal with Cold War challenges. We also used our leadership in the world to build new international institutions and new patterns of cooperation that boosted our prosperity and our political stability. From an economic perspective, our leaders understood that unless Europe and Japan recovered from wartime devastation, 
Americans could not enjoy strong foreign markets for their manufactured goods and their farm products. From a national security perspective, they also recognized the imperative of avoiding the collapse of American allies and former adversaries as well, and the need for them to regain their strength in order to contain the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And as a result of this type of thinking and this approach, the U.S. helped America's friends and allies and former adversaries to recover from the devastation of war. We, in so doing, revived overseas markets, which were in many ways the keys uh, to increased U.S. exports and the keys to sustained prosperity. And by strengthening their economies and giving them the tools to achieve social cohesion and stability at home, the United States also strengthened their capacities to defend themselves and proved to be robust partners in the NATO alliance and the U.S. alliance with Japan. New patterns of economic cooperation and new institutions had to be found to achieve these objectives. We can list them because they're familiar institutions and institutions that have proved their success over many decades. The GATT, the World Bank, the IMF, the Marshall Plan, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, all of them were designed to achieve our economic goals in the world, but also were critically important to American security in the world and to the stability of the global economy and the global political system. From the point of view of the success of these institutions, let me just cite a couple of numbers that demonstrate what happened as a result of creating this new order, this new set of institutions. In 1950, U.S. exports were $12 billion. Fifty years later, they were $1.1 trillion. In 1950, U.S. allies could afford only $5 billion in defense expenditures. In the year 2000, the figure was $172 billion. Picture, if you will, a counterfactual world in which these nations, the nations of Europe and Japan, failed to regain their economic strength and consider how different our own economy and our own security circumstances would have been in, those, in that environment. Over time, more countries joined the international economic system led by the United States and its allies. In fact, the Cold War ended not with World War III, but with former Cold War adversaries joining the very international economic institutions they had once shunned. Countries that two decades earlier had vowed to destroy the global market system were now seeking to become an integral part of that system. The system proved its effectiveness time and time again. The most recent demonstration of success was during the recent financial crisis. As former director of national, uh, Intel the National Intel Intelligence Council, Dennis Blair noted in February 2009, in his intelligence community annual threat assessment, the primary near-term security concern of the United States is the global economic crisis and its geopolitical implications. He was certainly correct in that analysis, again drawing the links between what happens in the world economy and America's national security. Now consider for a moment how much worse that crisis could have been and would have been without these institutions. Trade rules and norms forged in the 1940s and 1950s prevented countries from engaging in 1930s-style protections. Financial institutions helped to avoid 1930s-style currency disruptions and provided significant sums of money to countries in need of liquidity and support. That crisis that we've been through may have been the worst since the 1930s, but it also elicited the broadest and most effective display of international economic cooperation since that time as well, avoiding the kinds of foreign policy and security calamities that Admiral Blair had warned of. We're now in a new era, but we also face enormous challenges and uncertainties. Just as then, Americans must exercise leadership and our government must play a strong leadership role. In order to do so, we have to identify the new challenges of the 21st century and work with the international community to, serve, to seize the opportunities of this new era. 
I would like to just take a moment to list a few of the challenges we face today and the kinds of policies and cooperation required to address them. First is the new international economic geography. One of the fundamental challenges of this new era is the new multipolar global economy. Emerging nations have become financial, commercial, and technological players on the world stage. But these countries have economic agendas that are not always the same as those of the United States or the handful of industrialized countries that were the managers or the stewards of the global system for much of the last half century. Many of these nations have large numbers of people with very low incomes. Let's take the example of China, for instance. It has a population of 1.3 billion people, but its per capita gross domestic product is only one-seventh that of the United States. According to the World Bank, China's GDP per capita ranks 92nd in the world. Brazil's is 72nd, and India's is 121. And the average Chinese household consumes only 1 14th the value of goods and services purchased by the average American household. As a consequence, perceptions that shape these countries' international economic policies and continue to do so are very different from those of the industrialized economies. And that has to be taken into account when we look at the positions they take on many international economic issues. The second big change is shifting financial flows and circumstances. We've seen a significant shift in the flows of capital between industrialized and developing countries. In the past, flows of capital normally went from industrialized to developing countries. Now much of it is moving in the opposite direction. In 1990, the current account of emerging and developing countries as a group was close to balance. In 2008, they had a combined surplus of nearly $800 billion. Emerging market reserves now dwarf those of the industrialized economies. Their reserves are more than $6 trillion, up from only $350 billion in 1990. While advanced country reserves have risen from about $450 billion in 1990 to only about $2 trillion in 2009. Although a number of developing countries have historically struggled with sovereign de debt, for example, Mexico, Thailand, and Russia, this problem now seems to be a bigger issue for the industrialized economies. Debt as a percentage of GDP for the large emerging economies is about half what it is for the large industrialized economies. A third big change is the aftermath of the recession and the impact the recession has had on the way many of our citizens look at the global economy. We've just come through the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. I described that a little bit earlier and the role that global institutions played in combating it. But this problem and what we've been through still has left a long and very dark legacy. It has produced high levels of unemployment and devastated the savings of many, many millions of people in the United States and other parts of the world. It has also contributed to and generated, and some might say even uh, enhanced, the skepticism in the United States about the benefits of globalization, open trade policies, future trade liberalization, and subtypes of foreign investment. So one of the great economic as well as national security challenges for the United States is to demonstrate to the American people that our economy is returning to its previous resilience. We must show also to the rest of the world that our political system is able to make the hard choices needed to put our finances on a solid footing, to produce a robust economic policy, to produce a strong energy policy, to revitalize our infrastructure, to reform education, to devote more resources to research and development, and to pursue a proactive trade policy. Failure to do so will not only hurt the United States economy, it will undermine our global leadership. Our global strength is based in large measure on the success of the American economic and political system, which has shown remarkable resilience over the centuries to overcome problems and challenges. The challenge we face today is to demonstrate that kind of resilience, again, 
and to demonstrate that we can pull together to address the competitive challenges that we face internationally and the enormous challenges that we face at home. And next, uh, another area that, that is worth talking about for at least for a moment is the change in global interconnections that has taken place. As our daily lives become more dependent on computers, the internet, electronic transmission of funds, and smart grids, the threat to them grows. Global connectivity makes us all more efficient and many of us more prosperous, but it certainly makes virtually everyone more vulnerable as well. Cyber terrorism, cyber piracy, assaults on personal data, and threats to our national security information system are all dangerous 21st century threats to our economies, our technological leadership, and our security. Challenges to the free flow of goods and vessels on the high seas and in the air raise new potential for the disruption of people's lives, for acts of catastrophic terrorism, and for acts of piracy. Much effort is required to ensure cooperation in these common spaces. We've also seen how closely integrated financial markets are. Problems in one country or region simply can't be contained by borders or oceans. Another area of change is that of global competition. We also see that there is now intense competition, not just for markets, which we've known for a long time, but for capital, for energy, for rare earth minerals, and for other key commodities. And there's likely to be greater competition in the future for arable land and water. New rules and practices need to be established to avoid perceptions of zero-sum competition in these important areas. Areas. We need to define new rules that enable competition to take place on a level playing field with broader opportunities for commerce in these areas rather than more constrained global markets and greater acts of nationalism. Nationalistic practices in the setting of standards, procurement decisions, and regulation threatens to impede global competition and damage the global economy. In order to address these problems, we need to demonstrate that the American system and American leadership can still deliver, deliver in the 21st century. We have an interest in showing that democracy, free market capitalism, a strong entrepreneurial environment, the free flow of information, diversity and inclusivity are still the building blocks of economic growth and of economic opportunity for millions and millions of people in our own country if we're to encourage others to utilize these same types of practices. But as we address these issues at home, we need to recognize the changes in the global economy increase the urgency of cooperation among developed and developing economies. The emergence of a new group of economic powerhouses, principally but not only the BRICS, demonstrates the need for new forms of cooperation and new partnerships. These countries should assume responsibilities for the global economic system, commensurate with their growing role in it and the increasing benefits they derive from it. We welcome them as important markets for our products, just as we recognize that they are also strong competitors. But to win these markets, we need to make greater efforts through export promotion and trade agreements to gain access to those markets for our companies, for our workers, for our entrepreneurs. These would be a very important element and will continue to be a very important element, not only in our future economic recovery, but also in our long-term prosperity. These countries can also be an important source of investment flows that create American jobs. Let me also note that many of these emerging econ uh, economies have considerably upped their foreign assistance to developing countries and are working with the United States in a cooperative way. For example, the United States and Brazil work closely together in helping poor nations to develop biofuels. The US and India, as you will see on the President's trip, are planning joint programs to assist poor nations to develop their agricultural sectors. As a first principle, we and these economies must avoid the development of an environment in which competition for markets, energy, capital, food, or water is seen as a zero-sum game. Consistent with that principle, we also need to avoid circumstances in which countries engage in systematic efforts inconsistent with global rules and norms 
to enhance prospects for their domestic economies or companies that violate international rules at the expense of others. Such practices would cause enormous economic harm to the United States and other nations and to the integrity of the global economic system on which we all depend. In some cases, it can also have serious political and security consequences. Let me now turn briefly to the G20 and APEC because I mentioned the President will be going to summits at the G20 uh, that will be in Seoul, Korea and the APEC summit in Yokohama, Japan. We're now expanding and have continued to expand over the last several years our cooperation within the context of the G20. During the 2008 Washington summit and subsequent meetings in London, Pittsburgh, and Toronto, leaders charted a cooperative multilateral response to the global economic and financial crisis, a response that likely prevented a more secure, a, a serious decline and perhaps even a second great depression. President Obama will travel to Seoul next week where he will discuss these types of issues with G20 leaders. The G20 remains the fundamental element, the fundamental center of our international economic policy and the fundamental institution and cooperative arrangement for addressing many of the issues on the global economic agenda. It is important and cooperation within the G20 is important to supporting a strong, sustainable, and balanced global growth environment, which is essential to fostering global growth and also essential to growth and job creation here in the United States. We have outlined a cooperative framework for the Seoul Summit, building on the groundwork that finance ministers and central bank governors recently established in Korea. This agreement aims to reduce external imbalances, facilitate exchange rate adjustment, and establish an assessment mechanism at the International Monetary Fund. This framework at its core presents an important commitment that surplus countries, no less than deficit countries, will reduce external imbalances to sustainable levels. In addition to work on rebalancing financial reform and continued reform of international financial institutions, we are also developing robust proposals related to anti-corruption initiatives, energy cooperation, and development, including food security, financial inclusion, infrastructure, and fiscal governance and tax policy. The United States also aims to make greater use of APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, which President Obama will also participate in uh, on his trip. This will take on even greater significance in the following year as the United States continues to engage more actively and effectively, we hope, in the Pacific region. We will host the APEC Summit in 2011 and want that event to make a major step forward in cooperation in the region. We see growing opportunities for cooperation with APEC and for a trans-Pacific partnership on trade. But our ability to work with these countries effectively depends in part on our own efforts, and our efforts are going to be quite substantial and quite energetic, engaging the President, the Secretary of the Treasury, the Secretary of State, and many other uh, parts of our government. But we also see other countries in the region as playing a very strong role because APEC is fundamentally a partnership. And to the extent we can reduce barriers across the Pacific, to the extent we can agree on new rules and practices, to the extent we can see the world in uh, common terms through a common lens, we will be able to make a great deal of progress in APEC under American leadership when the leaders again meet next year in Honolulu, Hawaii. I also think it's important to note that while we talk about cooperation with emerging economies over the long run, uh, we also need to talk about cooperation with our old and more traditional partners, particularly the European Union. The European Union remains America's single largest investment, trade, and financial partner and a stalwart ally on many critical issues. Through groups such as the Transatlantic Economic Council, so-called TEC, we seek to reduce regulatory and other barriers between us so that we can together agree on high standards and induce others to meet them. But these groups alone are not sufficient to address the wide range of issues that this country focuses on uh, the international stage. The President's uh, upcoming trip to India and Indonesia are two major partners in 
and growing players in the regional economy and on global issues. And therefore, his trip is particularly important in strengthening the partnership we have between the United States and India and the United States and Indonesia. These are important democracies. They're important from a trade point of view. They're important from a security point of view. And they're important partners within the G20. And in dealing with issues such as the freedom of sea lanes and other uh, common matters. So this trip is going to be very important in solidifying our relationship and expanding our relationship with both countries. We also have other dialogues of a very intense nature, nature with other countries. The strategic and economic dialogue with China, the U.S.-Russian Presidential Bilateral Economic Commission, and the U.S.-India Strategic Dialogue, to name but three. There are many more. The goal here is to establish much closer and ongoing institutional political ties with many of these countries. And then finally, but perhaps most importantly, is the cooperation we have with our North American neighbors in NAFTA and through other fora. And those are, of course, Canada and Mexico. They're vital economic, political, and security partners for the United States. Their prosperity and vigor and their importance as markets, as well as suppliers of, of major energy and commodity uh, resources to the United States. And their security cooperation, political cooperation with us, is vital to our own prosperity and our own security. In short, just having reviewed these various elements of our cooperation very briefly, we've seen multiple opportunities to work with a wide range of countries and multipolar world and common global challenges. For us, a multipolar world is also a multi-partner world, and we aim to establish more and more of these partnerships. So let me conclude my remarks with a few general observations. I think we can all agree that a new global economy is emerging, but new challenges also require new responses. The big question is whether governments can design new patterns of cooperation and new institutional arrangements to keep up with these challenges. Some of the responses that we require have already uh, emerged, for instance, the creation and the greater use of the Group of 20. Some of these responses involve enhancing the work of groups that have served us well in the post-World War II era, the WTO, the IMF, and the World Bank, and the OECD, and other institutions. One of the principal features of this new landscape is, of course, the emergence of these large economies and the emergence of greater cooperation between us and these economies. These economies, and this is going to be a key test of our ability to work with them, need to be integrated effectively into the global economic system so they can assume the responsibilities that go along with their new status and so that we can work with them in common on global and national economic challenges. And that, finally, is why we were focusing so much on this topic of governance. We all recognize that the global economy is not the same as it was 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. The new international economy will require some new building blocks, but we are also fortunate that the ones we have in place from the post-war period provide an excellent foundation. And the ones that we have recently created or enhanced, such as the G20, should continue to build effective cooperation. There are enormous new opportunities before the United States over the course of the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. The two elements that will enable us to succeed in capitalizing those, on those opportunities is one, to deal with the problems we face at home, to pull together in the face of the challenges that, that the United States is experiencing, to deal with the issues that I mentioned at the outset, education, infrastructure, putting ourselves on a strong financial footing, addressing the energy issues uh, that we face and that other countries face. Strength at home, economic strength at home, economic vitality at home is critical to American leadership abroad. The second element is to pull together domestically and internationally to figure out ways of engaging the American economies to a greater degree in the global system, to make them a greater part of the system and that they assume greater responsibilities for it. They depend more and more on the well-functioning global system that we all want, and now they have to take greater responsibility for making sure the system does function effectively. If we can deal with our problems at home in a robust way, and if we can address the problems of the global economy, particularly the emerging economies, in an effective way over the next several years, then I think the prospects for the United States 
in coming decades for our children and grandchildren to look very good. If we cannot do this, if we cannot deal with our problems at home, if we cannot address these global economic problems effectively, then the chances for us and our children and our grandchildren to enjoy the kinds of opportunities that we have uh, been able to enjoy uh, diminish quite considerably. Thank you very much.